Hello and welcome back everyone. Uh, now, the next study question. So, we just finished 102, which was, oh look at that, it's doing that thing again where it keeps zooming in. I wonder if this is getting stuck or something. Okay, there we go. We just did 102, where it was a comparison of the way we do deficit spending right now in this column and the way that the uh, post-Keynesian approach is suggesting that we do it instead. And obviously they are, they are arguing that it is superior on the far right. Now, the next study question says, draw the diagram that shows, using Koleski's notation, how the entry points and means by which unemployment is reduced for both the tradition, uh, oh, I'm sorry, shows how Oh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the means by which unemployment is reduced for both the traditional and deficit spending, uh, traditional deficit spending and an employer of last resort. The, the goal here, remember I told you that the uh, chairman of the piece, oh, and, I, and I, if you're looking at this now, I've already emailed it to you because I would have included it in any email uh, that I sent around with some of the last exam uh, study questions. Uh, anyway, so remember that chairman of the whole point of that Koleski article with, here, let me slide up here real quick and remind you, with all of this stuff, oh, there it is. Those equations here, you know, which we did in another video, and then here deriving the price equation. I told you that the whole point was for her to develop a model with which she could examine the impact of deficit spending uh, on the unemployed, you know, is it getting to the people who most need the money? And so it got a little bit complicated at that point, the article did, so I thought I would just sort of simplify it with this diagram right here and show you the difference. All right, the traditional approach, uh, it, it ends up being very similar to investment spending increasing, all right? Uh, the way that we do government spending, uh, it, it, it is in some respects uh, similar to the way investment spending works such that it increases profits and it increases wages and employment in the investment goods sector. All right, so for example, if we were to do infrastructure spending, which again is a perfectly legitimate thing to do if our goal is to increase the quality of our infrastructure. But it's not a very good thing to do if you're trying to lower unemployment because the money that's spent tends to go into profits. Because don't forget, this is profits, and remember WINI is also profits. WINI ends up being the profits in the consumption goods sector, so check that out. Profits, profits. Now, there is going to be a positive impact of any kind of government spending on wages and employment in the consumption goods sector. And these are generally going to be the workers who are the worst off the consumption goods sector rather than the investment goods sector. They tend to be higher paid workers, right? It doesn't mean they uh, don't get laid off and so forth, but they tend to have higher pay to start with and uh, a skill set that enables them to move more easily. So the traditional means of deficit spending, it takes a long time for it to actually have an impact on the people that we're really worried about. Whereas the employer of last resort, the increase, in, I, I did an NG here, employment in the, that, that was the dog hacking, uh, employment in the government sector, uh, well that's immediately addressing the problem. So the point at which unemployment reduction occurs is immediate, is eventual, most of the money ends up in profits, all right? So that's the whole thing for that diagram. I, I, I felt it was important to return to this Koleskian, uh, I guess, notation because, as I said, the whole point of Chernova was to show the, how the um, uh, d different types of deficit spending impact on the economy, and that's why she bothered to do all that in the first place. Okay, so let's see, now where are we? I may cut this video. How long have I been talking? Uh, just four minutes, right? That, that, that study question didn't take very long. Uh, and I'm not sure I want to jump into the next one as part of this, but let's slide down here. Okay, that was 103. All right, so the next article is Chernova argues that it, here she's going into uh, how unemployment is affects people uh, and that it's a bit like, huh, huh. I'm going to zoom out a little bit so you can see it all better. Yeah, that's better. And let me go close the door because Melanie's watching TV. 
Um, so uh, Chernova here is writing a piece on unemployment, the silent epidemic, and she kind of compares it to a virus of all things, given that we're, uh, given that we're having uh, such an issue right now. And basically she's going through some of the things we don't usually, well, I don't you know, always talk about in a macro class, and that is the actual cost of unemployment. I had a guy in one of my uh, nighttime uh, MLA, Masters in Liberal Arts classes, uh, years ago, and I was having everyone write a paper on the current state of the economy. And without asking me, and that was fine, he probably should have asked me though, but, but he ended up writing this long paper on all the things he went through while he was unemployed and how horrific it was. Uh, and he just wanted to get it off his chest, I think. Uh, and so there are a lot of psychological and um, health issues. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things you're going to find in here is that a, a, a study, which one is it here? Um, a metadata analysis of 63 countries revealed that how many suicides are due to unemployment? The answer is one in five are related to unemployment. It's a hell of a lot, all right? Uh, so, uh, go, you can read these, this one easy enough, it's not a big problem. Uh, I'm not going to go over that with you. Uh, but then that leads us to the very last lecture question on post-Keynesian economics. After that, we're going to do something a little bit different. But the very last lecture uh, question is a bit of a summary. It's saying, okay, all right, we've gone through all this stuff uh, on, you know, okay, look back at it. So, so, so we did like the, let me turn this slide up. I actually have like movie theater lighting and stuff in here. I have like the, the little uh, light with the, with the umbrella thing behind it and so forth. But as you can see, it's not very powerful right now. Let me turn on some of the lights. There's a lot of contrast now because it's the sun setting outside and it's kind of bright in here. Uh, is that somewhat better? Yeah, all right. So anyway, think about the entire semester. So we start off with some terminology. We did the uh, injections and leakages. I uh, did all the statistical stuff from that one uh, little book, the Clayton and Giesbrecht and Gill book. And then we went through the determinants of consumption, the determinants of investment. And that took us through exam one and part of exam two, where we had the business cycle. Then a whole bunch on the financial sector. Then here, just the last few here, we shifted gears. Now let's look at things from a Koleskian perspective. And remember, the point of economics is policy. That's what makes us different from the business school. In the business school, you might learn, you know, clearly you go, you go ahead and learn how the economy works, but then once you learn how the economy works, they tell you, now here's how you can make money in it. When we teach you how the economy works, we say, should the economy work that way? All right, it's a policy discipline. We're trying to figure out, is it organized in a way that is beneficial to those who are in the economy? So, this last study question here, we've gone over various policy issues here in the, in the last couple of videos. It's just a summary. In summary, what are the post-Keynesian policy recommendations with respect to unemployment, inflation, and the financial sector? I realized a couple semesters ago, I, what, th th there wasn't a nice, neat place where I stopped and talked about this. You know, okay, let's stop and summarize. Where, where do we stand now after all this stuff? And here, I'm going to give you the answer because it's a lecture question. Uh, and, oh, that's more Chernobyl stuff. Ah, here we go. Perfect. All right, so what are the post-Keynesian policy recommendations? So, so you have three things to mention. Look, unemployment, inflation, and the financial sector. Unemployment is the jobs program. It's the employer of last resort. That's what they say you ought to do about that. You ought to be trying to, if I may, shift the Z curve and not the D curve, all right, and directly affect the unemployment and reach those who are most hurt. Uh, okay. Look at it back there. Yeah. All right. And I'm sorry. Let me have a look at the monitor and make sure it's focusing well. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right. Uh, so you might want to pause the video here and write all this down. But unemployment, uh, well, I, I probably will email you this one, but still. Uh, you'll already know that by the time you watch this because I'm saving all these videos until after the exam. You're about, you haven't taken exam two yet uh, at this point in history. So unemployment, the jobs program stuff. Inflation, determine the beneficiary of the redistribution and address it directly. For example, uh, if we have demand pull inflation, which means that the economy is growing very rapidly and we're bidding up prices, uh, let's say right now, in, uh, well, actually it's a little bit of a different situation right now, but let's say there, there, there's a big increase in construction and the prices of bricks go up. 
Should we throw the economy into recession because the price of bricks went up? Or should we allow the market to do what the market does well? And that is create signals to other entrepreneurs that, hey, I should be making bricks too. Price is going way up. And uh, to those who are using the bricks, hey, I should substitute away from bricks. You know, the post Keynesian recommendation is just let the market do what it's going to do. This is not a reason to try to throw the economy into recession. An increase in prices because of an increase in demand is not a reason to throw the economy into recession. What about inflation caused by... Um, OPEC, all right, the, the 1970s, we went over all that in class. Well, there, there actually is no way for us to directly affect that, but clearly the, the beneficiary of the redistribution here is going to be those who have market power. And in an international situation, it's kind of hard to do anything about that. But domestically, if we have uh, firms or workers who are able to redistribute income towards themselves, which is what the increases in price are symptomatic of, uh, then we want to directly address that. What did we do? I'm sure you learned this in high school with the Sherman Antitrust Act and the uh, trust busting that took place. These firms were gaining more and more and more market power. And so they were redistributing income towards themselves. Yeah, we do something about that. But we don't throw the entire economy into recession to address that because obviously they would be the last ones to be hurt. Right? Instead, what we do is we directly address the problem. Regulate, break up, whatever it turns out to be the most reasonable uh, means at the time. Financial sector. Here we're pulling off a of Steve Keen stuff. And it says, you know, what do we do about this? Steve Keen's argument that the essential policy message is that we should avoid crises in the first place. I went over this on uh, an earlier video. Developing and maintaining institutions and policies that enforce good financial society in which the tendency by businesses and bankers to engage in speculative finance is constrained. All right, so first thing he's saying is, look, we need to constrain the temptation that there is uh, to take on increasingly risky positions uh, when the economy is going well. Because that just puts us that much closer to collapse when the downturn occurs. So how do we do that? How do we make sure that this happens? Well, institutional arrangements must include close and discretionary supervision of financial institutions. That means that we're going to watch the banks and the, uh, we're not going to do what we did before the financial crisis, and that was basically not enforce the laws that were already in place, not enforce the rules. Janet Yellen talked about that after the financial crisis, that there was, um, there were laws on the books that should have prevented a lot of this. We just didn't bother to enforce them, so we can't do that. And discretionary supervision, now, I've talked about this already, but let, let's go over it again. Discretionary supervision, the ability to deal with unique situations in a unique manner. The, we, we cannot rely on, hey, we've made up some rules, that should take care of everything. No, the financial sector has every reason to try to come up with ways that they can take on these more um, speculative positions and do so without anyone else noticing, which is precisely what happened up to the financial crisis. Uh, so, that part. The second part is, and we should really have a bias towards income equity rather than income inequality. He's not saying everybody should have the same income, but he's saying a bias towards income equity <clears throat> because that creates a stronger economy for a number of reasons. As you know, it's going to increase the multiplier uh, because the people down in the lower income range are going to spend more of their money. Pardon me. <clears throat> And also, uh, we're going to have the issue that they're not going to be going into debt as much. What if, you, what if you or your parents earned more money already? How much less debt would you be in right now going to college? Right? So those are the policy recommendations. And that uh, is essentially the core part of the macro class. Uh, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to go over that assignment where you get free points. I'm going to do that here in just uh, a minute. But then... The last thing we do lecture-wise is, and I'll email you all these answers because uh, they're all lecture questions and I will not be able to lecture to you, um, but, uh, and there's a lot of graphs in here. But what I'm gonna do last is, I'm gonna compare what we've done so far to neoclassical Keynesian. Not post-Keynesian, but neoclassical Keynesian, the ones who took Keynes to be saying that, oh yes, yeah, says law holds but there's some things that are interfering with it. And this was a very popular approach here, uh, this ISLM curve stuff. If um, you've already had intermediate macro, then perhaps you're repeating it now, uh, you may have had ISLM curves. That's what I had in school. Very popular, it came out in 1937. Uh, and so I'm gonna go over ISLM curves. Those will be the last study questions that we do.
Yeah, uh, but before I do that, so I'm going to stop this video here uh, and then I'm going to set up all the stuff to do the spreadsheet assignment uh, for which you get free points. Uh, so, see ya.